Okay, so uh, if ever we get everybody to jump onto our website again really quickly, we're going to take a look at first thing I'm going to bring up, and I just go ahead and open this up and take a look at it with me really quick. Uh, it's this AMP cost of doing business. Uh, uh, CO, uh, it's the cost of doing business calculator. Um, and the only reason I ask you to bring this up is that when you first go to try to do this calculation, I think that this will actually help you. Um, it just helps you define the terms. So basically, <clears throat> what this is trying to do is to come up with a way to figure out what it really is going to cost you to live in a given year. Um, so the idea is this. If you can figure out, let's say, for instance, you go through and you figure out that after everything is said and done, it's going to cost you $30,000 a year to live. Um, and you figure that you can actually bill 100 days a year. So it's going to be 30 grand. That's what you can make. And you can do it in 100 days. So you, can, you have 100 days of billing that you can actually do it. So basically, you knock off those two zeros, and you know that you have to make $300 a day to uh, survive. It's that simple. So does that make sense to everybody? So we're actually going to go through this and talk about those parts. So at any rate, this is just helps give you a set of terms. But you see where it says here on the top that at its most basic, this is what it is. You take your non-reimbursable expenses. And what non-reimbursable expenses means is simply this. Let's say that you are going to shoot a wedding, and you're actually going to manage the whole thing. And so you actually rent the country club where you're going to shoot this thing. That's a cost that you're going to actually pass on to the people who have hired you to do the shooting. That is a billable expense. What is a non-billable expense would be probably the gas that you put in your car to drive up there. It would also be the cost of your camera, um, because if you're not charging for your camera, you, in the old days we used to charge for film and processing. You guys you, uh, would be charging for, um, if you're not charging for the wear and tear on your digital camera, you're leaving stuff on the table. Who's paying for that? You. Right. So anyway, I'm just trying to make a distinction here between non-reimbursable expenses and reimbursable ones. So non-reimbursable, we need to talk about your desired salary. Your goal in this game is to not break even. If you're just breaking even and you're just getting by, you're not saving any money, you'll have a really shitty old life. Um, so you have to have a desired salary in all of this. That's going to equal your annual cost. Then you simply divide that by the number of billable days. The days that you can actually bill for this. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what this whole thing is about here. And that's like I said, desired salary. That's an issue that we've got in here. But if you're saying to yourself, well, I don't really know what that means, whatever. This is strictly a page that will give you and say, you know, this is basically what it is. Um, it's basically a uh, uh, money that, you know, that's over and above what you're actually what it, it's costing you to actually live in a given year or whatever. So anyway, that's what this whole thing is about. It's only page long, so don't. it's really not that much. Um, but the next thing down is something, and I want you to go ahead and click on this, the NPAA cost of doing business calculator. Now, this thing was not working um, uh, six months ago, but it actually is working now. I ran it last night. So I just I don't want you to actually fill this out right now because I want you to spend some time with this, really thinking about this. Do not look at this as an abstract. I need you to be really serious about this. So when it goes here, when it talks about your uh, phone costs, your cell phone costs, you really need to go back and look at your cell phone bill. Because I can say to you, oh, yeah, I have an AT&D plan. It's 100 bucks a month for two lines. That's what it is. But the truth of the matter is it's 124 something because of all the taxes that they dump on it. Well, that extra twenty-four dollars uh, a month, whatever, over the course of a year is another six hundred dollars. So you need to calculate this exactly. Yes. Is this monthly? No, this is this will be for a year. Okay. And you'll see down at the uh, end of it, it will actually then generate your monthly cost and your yearly cost. So I want to go through just a couple things about how this guy works, uh, and then I'm going to let you guys actually do this um, during the week. Um, but also know this. If you click on any of these headings right here, like this one, the office and the studio, it'll drop down and it'll actually explain to you what you're really looking to, to what they're, the number that they're actually looking for here. However, the one thing that I have a problem with in this guy right here is that they separate this out as if you, um, uh, they don't, what, what they don't really have a provision in this for is the rent of wherever you're really living. And you need to make that a part of this calculation. The way I think they're trying to treat this 
is almost more if you had a studio and you were living in your studio. Because the truth of the matter is, yes, somewhere in this whole calculator, if you've got a house that you're living in, let's say you're, you're living in an apartment, but you're also renting a studio, somehow you need to account for both of those rents. Then that's got to go in here. I've looked through the rest of this, and I haven't seen anywhere else in here that they're actually giving you a place to put in a cost for your, your house rent. Does that make sense? So this would be the one place that I would actually put it in. If you see it somewhere else in here, if I actually missed it, it's fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter where, where you actually put these things um, because all this is is a checklist to come up with your actual cost. But again, you need to be really specific about this. If there's some weird, let's say you're living in a condo and and it's not only your you know what you're paying for the rent, but you've also got um, uh, um, uh, some condo fee on top of it or a gym fee on top of it. This would just basically they should have just left this as just rent in my opinion or or mortgage, but nonetheless, you get. Does that make sense? What's going on here? Well, I mean, you don't have. <laughs> Extra offices or studios right now, so you just that or it shouldn't be better. I know what I'm saying is, is that let's say you have no studio or other office, you would just have got an apartment. Mm -hmm. You would take the rent of that apartment and put it in here because this is the money that you are going to need to spend for a year to live, and your rent has definitely got to be a part of that. Oh, yeah. That's the only thing I was trying to make here. It should it's just I think the Titling on that is just a little misleading. Yeah. So I just didn't I, I didn't want you to look at that and say, well, I don't have an office or a studio, so that should just be zero. The truth of the matter is someplace in this calculator you need to come up with what it's costing you to uh, have a bedroom or whatever it is, blah, blah, blah. Okay, makes sense? Um, then the rest of this, again, is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, your phone, again, you need to be real specific about this. Do not ballpark these figures. Um, that will only undermine uh, how accurate this thing can actually be for you. You'll see here, again, they also talk about photo, video equipment. They put in a series of numbers here. The numbers that they've actually put in here, they say are the average that you should, that the average photographer, whatever, should be considering. These are not supposed to be just you know, wild uh, uh, numbers, just uh, placeholders. They're actually saying that they feel like your general equipment service and repair should run about $1,000 a year as a photographer. Now, you can be really specific about this. You can say, well, I don't own any equipment. I rent all my equipment, so I don't have any cost here at all. That's all fine and well, but then somewhere down in here, you're going to run into your, you know, the rental, uh, uh, you know, rental gear or something. I mean, all of, you need to figure out all of those things that are a part of what it costs you to live. And be as specific as you can about this. If there is something that you do, if you've got an insane crack habit, then you need to somewhere in here figure out, okay, well, I can't really call it my crack habit, so I don't really spend anything on postage, but I'm going to put my $15,000 a year crack habit into this line item right here. It'll still work. The calculator will work. Does that make sense? The categories are not necessarily specific it's just so that makes sense to everybody okay so I need you to actually go through this so once you put all these figures in as you go down to the very bottom you'll see when you get down to the bottom um, this use default or just these numbers so you would not use default you can simply start out to do your calculation you would simply hit clear fields and it puts it zeros everybody out and then you simply go through and you type in all of your numbers and what once you get all your numbers typed in uh, again, you hit the submit button and it will come up with, oh, and you have to add, this is your desired annual salary. So again, this desired annual salary is over and above what it's costing you to live. So let's say you come up with all of your expenses and you say, okay, after all of that money, I would still like to clear $1,000 a month. That's after my rent's paid, my car's paid, all my parking is paid, the movies are paid for, the utilities are all paid for, my cable bill's paid for, my phone is paid for, my studio is paid for, all of that shit is paid for. What do you want above that, over and on top of that? $1,000 a year, in my opinion, would be a very noble, reasonable figure for somebody coming out of Columbia College, I would think. $1,000 a year? No, $1,000 a month, 12000 a year. Again, everything else has been paid for, so this is like, you know, you're living, you're paying for all of that shit, and then this is on top, right? You'll be surprised at what the, where these numbers actually ultimately come in. But that's up to you. If you say, fuck that, I want to pay, I want $4,000 a month, well, then put that figure in there. So at any rate, then you need to come down, and you need to actually figure out, and this is, becomes the harder part in all of this, this non-assignment income, what this really is, is a place for you 
to enter, let's say you're a trust fund kid, and mom and dad give you $2,000 a month just to do whatever you want to with it. That would be where you would actually put this figure right here. So this has got, this is income that you're making that doesn't have anything to do with the photography business. Does that make sense? So if you've got another job that you, you, you're working at, you know, Starbucks, this is where that uh, income would actually go into here. And then finally, the number of days that you actually can bill. How many billing days would you think you could bill as a photographer? Well, I'll tell you. A typical photographer will spend three days for every day of shooting. So you usually have a day of prep, you have a day of shooting, and a day of post. That's just typically how it works out. So the way most people would look at this is that if you've got 100 days of shooting, that actually equals 300 days a year. That's a very busy year. If you have 120 days of shooting, you are slammed. But that's 360 days a year that you are actually working. You have no life. <laughs> An average photographer is probably working 80 days a year. That's, I mean, 80 days during the year. That actually equates. These are billing days. These are actual working days. This would work out to 240 uh, uh, days a year. And that's a typical year. If you think of most people, and again, these are just general averages, but this will help guide you in this direction. Most people do a 50 work week a year. Most people take two, day, two weeks off for vacation or two weeks off that they're not going to work. So if you figure there's five working days in that 50 week, it's 250 days out of the year you're going to work. And that's why this 80 right here is an average. If you're doing 60 a day, I mean 60 a year, you're actually coming in at 180, you're struggling. And if you're doing anything less than that. So these are figures that you can actually basically come in and sort of try to figure out what your year is really going to be like. Now, some of this is going to be based on speculation. Some of this is going to be based on experience. Some of you are already working, and you're already going to know how many days this is. If you're not, I would suggest that you probably stay somewhere, again, initially starting out in this 80 to 60 range. Somewhere in this area is probably a legitimate for your first year out on your own. Make sense? OK. I have a question. Shoot. So when we fill this out, should we do it as we are right now? Yes, you okay. should, as you are right now. And be honest. Be brutally honest about it. In terms of this, really coming up with the days, this is going to be speculative. But again, what we just looked at is that if you come up here, if you look at your, you know, your, your ultimately how this uh, works out, you come up with the total cost of your year, your cost of doing business calculator, and even if you just, just throw in a number of 100 or whatever, you'll see, you'll get some really pretty close idea. For the most part, I have done this exercise not using this calculator, but really just doing it in a completely different class where the entire class just started calling out figures. So what's your average rent? What do you guys pay in rent? 500, 1,000, 750, whatever. So that's a good figure. We put it up on the board like that. We carry, I've done this, I don't know how many times, whatever. And in typical, most students at Columbia College, the nut most of you guys have is somewhere in the thirty to $40,000 a year range. That does not include student loans. So that's kind of the figure. And so you figure that, okay, if that's the case, then based on this hundred, this is with no salary on top of this, but based on a hundred days, that would be $300 a day. How many people in here have gotten a job as an assistant working for $150 for the day? Can't survive. Can't do it. This class gets ugly, I've just got to say. But don't let that worry you. It gives you solid footing and a grounding to actually know exactly, again, what is it you need? What is it you're worth? Okay. Um, we're going to go off there. So anyway, this is part of your assignment, so I don't really want to spend more time on this. I'm not going to do this with you guys right now. However, we're going to get into something that maybe you haven't gotten in in your other classes. So if you can open up, again, it's another thing that's on here. It would be – oh, sorry, I'm looking – it's highlighted. Uh, this business comparison chart, if you guys can open up this for me. So we need to talk about the type of business that you actually do open up as a, 
um, uh, a photographer because there are serious advantages to the kind of business that you actually have. Most people do not take advantage of this when they first start out, and most people, which is bad, but most people make things worse by really not taking advantage of what they could possibly take advantage of as things go on and as you start to actually make money and become more successful. So what you're looking at on this chart right here is you'll see that there is one, two, three, four, five sort of different business entities that you could actually be. So the one that most of you would start out as or go out in the business world and actually do is this sole proprietorship. And if you look at here, it'll tell you sort of the advantages and disadvantages. So as a sole proprietorship, you, uh, you do not have to be a citizen of the United States in order to do that. Um, you, uh, you, you do report your business profit and loss on a personal tax return, with, and there's a serious advantage to that. Um, and then finally, this one down here, you're not required to hold annual meetings or record anything. So basically, in a sole proprietorship, you simply make money. You have a personal tax return. In addition to what you would normally have on a personal tax return, you have what they call a Schedule C. Schedule C is just your business income, and it's, that's where that part is handled. So let's say, for instance, you do work at Starbucks, and you've also got a photo business going. And at Starbucks, you made 30 grand during the year, and in your photo business, you made 20. So what would end up happening is, is that on the front page of your tax return, they would actually have a place to put in the income from Starbucks. That would be a W-2. That's what all of you got. Everybody in this room has gotten a W-2, right? There is a copy of a W-2 on our website as well if you want to take a look at it. But it's the thing that they always send you that you usually get at the end of January. It's what you made. It's how much tax they held on you, and that's it. Right? So that would be that income. However, your business has generated income as well. And that income needs to be actually structured in such a way that you look at the money that you made in your business, but also the money that you spent in your business, what your expenses were. Basically, what companies, and this is all companies look at, is you take how much money you made, and you subtract how much money it costs you to do it, your expenses, and what is left is your profit. You pay tax on your profit. You don't pay tax on what you made. You don't pay tax on the expenses part, whatever. You pay tax on your actual profit. Does that make sense? So let's say, for instance, you made $10,000. That's what you made in your business. But you had $5,000 in expenses. And what do I mean by expenses? Well, you bought a camera. That was $1,000. You, um, uh, uh, one of your jobs you had to fly to, to Las Vegas to actually shoot it, so your plane ticket would be an expense. Uh, you had a hotel room, that would also be an expense. Um, so let's, you know, uh, let's say your expenses all totaled up to $5,000, then what they would actually do is you would subtract the 5000 from the ten. you would have $5,000 in profit. This is what gets taxed, is this part right here. This is the taxable part of your income. That $5,000 would also get brought around to the very front page of your tax return, and they would add it to the $32,000 or the $30,000 that you made from Whole Foods or Starbucks or whatever, and then your ultimate taxable income would be $35,000. Does that make sense? We'll talk more about expenses here and what you can really write off and how you can write it off. But so that's basically how it goes. The other extreme in this would actually be what they call a C corporation. This is what General Motors is. This is what Apple is. This is what IBM is. These are C corporations. What happens in C corporations, there's a whole different series of things here. I'm not going to go through these things because unless somebody's got a gun to your head and you're really big, you do not want to be a C corporation. You lose all sorts of tax advantages. You can't do this personal tax thing. You actually have to fill out corporate returns for this. You do for other things in here as well, but we'll talk about those uh, when we get to them. So um, the sort of two extremes. The biggest problem that I have got with a sole proprietorship, and this is the thing that you guys need to, there's two issues that are at stake here, and it all falls under the umbrella of liability. In a sole proprietorship, you are responsible, you are legally responsible for everything that happens within that job framework. So two things that can happen. Number one, you can go into debt. You can go bank. You can go. Essentially, you go into debt. You end up spending more money than you make, and you reach the point where you owe fifty thousand dollars, and you decide to go bankrupt. That bankruptcy falls on you. It falls on your name. It destroys your credit. You're the one who takes the hit for all of that. If you are either an LCC or an S or a C corporation, that is not true. 
In those cases, those guys take on the liability. We'll talk about how that actually works in just a second. The other thing, but that's death. The other thing is that if somebody is really hurt, so liability, injury, and it doesn't have to just be a person. It can actually be uh, injury to a uh, building or to an estate. So you're doing a photo shooting at a beautiful house up in Winnetka. Your power pack shorts out, sets the house on fire, burns to the ground. You're responsible. As a sole proprietorship, you will be working for those people for the rest of your life because you personally are responsible for that. You don't want to be personally responsible for that. One of the biggest dangers, especially in what we do, because what we do involves heavy gear, electricity, power, um, all sorts of things, all sorts of things that can go horribly wrong, right? So the two things, liabilities, that we're worried about are injury and death. In an LCC corporation, limited, this is a limited corporation, an S corp or a C corp, um, in any three of these entities right here, what basically happens is this. You create this entity. That's what they call it. It is not, it's, it's sort of like an artificial person, as it were. It's, so what happens for me, I, I have an S corporation called Englehart Studio Incorporated. I actually work for that company. I own the company, I'm the president of it, but I work for that company. But the important issue here is that that company is its own entity. So if I burn down the house, they sue Englehart Studio, they sue that company, and they can sue that company into oblivion. They can sue it to the point that all of its money is gone, and there is no more money, and it ceases to be, but they cannot come after me. Does that make sense? What? So, so what? What, what is the, the key difference between being a Okay, so here, here, so, so, okay, so here's the case, here's the case. I'm not, a, I'm not really uh, very good at drawing, but I'll try. So, in a sole proprietorship, I feel like you guys can't see this. The dynamics in this room suck. Anyway, uh, I'll start over here. So let's say this a uh, sole proprietorship. Um, let's say you've actually been working for five years and you've actually managed to save up uh, $50,000. So that's your nest egg. Make sense? Okay, so you've got your $50,000. This is your nest egg. And you have a horrible accident. And that accident is a $1 million event. You burn the house to the ground. One of the kids in the house dies. It's not a $1 million event, it's a $5 million event. You're on the hook for that. So you got your little $50,000 nest egg they wipe that out. They just come in and they can. They just take it. It's gone. Then you also are liable for them to work this million dollars off, and you continue to work for them for the rest of your life. In a S corporation, an LCC or a C corporation, what happens? So this is you. This is your sole proprietorship. This is you. This is all the same thing. You are that sole proprietorship. You're liable for everything. You're liable for the money. You're liable for everything. Make sense? Let's take a different scenario. Same thing, same situation here, same nest egg right here. But this doesn't happen. Let's just say that you got your $50,000 nest egg, and you know business is going really good. So you go out and you buy all brand new pro photo gear, and you spend $100,000 on it. So all of a sudden, your nest egg now, you, so this is your equipment, your, your, this is something you just spent. Money, I just went nuts and I just spent it. So uh, you spend your $100,000. You're now $50,000 in the hole. Uh, parentheses actually indicate negatives. But I'll put a negative there as well. You're now $50,000 in the hole. And all of a sudden, you realize that you Somebody threw acid in your eyes. You're blind. You can't be a photographer anymore. 
You know, actually, I'm trying my best to, to energize this crowd, to keep you awake. I'm taking acid in the eyes. And, God, that sounds really bad. Uh, anyway, you can't work anymore, So, but you owe $50,000. You're not able to work. You can't make any money. You owe $50,000, and at the end of the year, whoever you owe this to is going to come knocking on the door, and you're going to say, I can't pay you off. So you have to declare bankruptcy. When you declare bankruptcy, your credit goes into the garbage. You, again, are liable for this. You made the mistake. You took the hit. Does that make sense? So in either one of these cases, you, as a person, are screwed. So that's this case, sole proprietorship. In the case of an LCC, an S Corp, or a C Corp, what happens is this, you actually, instead of you as the sole proprietorship, you've actually got the corporation, so it's this, so this is going to be our corporation here. You work for the corporation, this is you outside of this, but you are not the corporation, you work for it. Now, you can own it, you can be the only person who works for it. It can seem just like it was a sole proprietorship, but it's not, because you've gone through the legal rigmarole that you need to go through to become either an LCC, an S Corp, or a C Corp. This takes lawyers, it takes accounting, it takes time, um, all sorts of issues here. But now the issue that's important for us, so let's say you do this. Let's say you make either an LCC, an S Corp, or a C Corp, and you're the only person who works for it. You own it. It's all your money. You own it outright, that's all fine. But now what happens is our very same scenario. You got your $50,000 nest egg, there's the million dollar accident, what happens is this. The million dollar accident happens, the insurance company comes to you and says, you've got $50,000 in the corporation, and you say, yes I do. They say, we're taking your $50,000, and I say, okay. The corporation is dissolved, they get $50,000, and that's the end of the story. You are not personally responsible for any of the rest. It gets even better. You could actually suck this $50,000 out of the corporation before the insurance company gets it and give them nothing, and you still are not responsible. You keep your money. Oh, guys, I'm going to tell you how to fuck the whole system as hard as I possibly can. I'm not going to tell you anything illegal, but you want to know how the big boys play this and how they get away with all this shit? You want to know how Donald Trump can lose almost a billion dollars a year in one year and still, I don't know, buy an airline the next year? It's unfortunate that this isn't becoming more the norm to talk to you about all of this, exactly this sort of situation right here. because. This is the games that you can begin to play to hang on to your money. Does that make sense what's going on here? Are there questions about this guy? So again, debt liability and injury liability are the two things that you avoid the most. I'm, I, I, hang on one second. And that's what's right up here. The owners have limited liability for business debts and obligations. In a sole proprietorship, it is all on you. In an LCC, in an S Corp, and in a C Corp, and I'm avoiding general partnerships right here because number one, I don't think they're really well. Number one, they don't have they have all the liabilities basically of a sole proprietorship. It just means that there's more people involved. It means that two of you guys can get together and and essentially have a sole proprietorship with two people instead of one. So there's not a whole lot of it more advantage to this. So that's don't get the feeling that I'm ignoring this. What I'm really wanting you guys to focus on are these because these are the money makers for you guys. Make sense? Okay. So I'm sorry, what were you going to ask? You said Apple is a sole proprietor? No, 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 no. Apple is a C Corp. Okay. I was Apple is this guy right here. C Corps are the big guys. Okay. So there are then differences in this in terms of what you do, and I want to talk about those differences right now. So there are, I'm hopefully convincing every single one of you that you should never open as a sole proprietorship. You should only open as. In the beginning, my suggestion is that you open as an LCC, and your next step would be to actually open as a S corporation, and you should try to maintain that status as long as you possibly can. 
in some cases, when I moved to New York and opened my studio in New York, the state of New York insisted that I be a C corporation. The money was just too big. Um, we fought it. We lost. We fought it again. We lost again. We fought it a third time and actually got a redesignation as an S corporation. And I'll talk to you guys about what the difference is. Yes? I was just wondering, did Apple start off as a C corporation? Oh, no, 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 they probably started off, I guess, I don't know how big they got really quick, but my guess is that when it was just the two of them originally, yeah. it was probably an S corporation is where they probably went, but the minute they started taking on serious personnel and that's a factory, you're a C corporation. They only let you get so big as an S corporation. Yes? And why is that, that they only let you get so big? Uh, because of money. That's what we're going to talk about right now. Taxes. Oh. So they can charge you more taxes on the C corporation? Much more. Yeah. <laughs> you not only pay taxes, without getting too far ahead of the game here, because it's what I'm going to try and share right now. In a corporation, C corporation setup, you pay corporate tax on all the money that's earned, and then all the money that's either distributed as, as, as stock dividends or anything else is taxed again. So it's hit twice. In an S corporation, it's only hit once. But there's other advantages. Okay, so we're going to look at an LCC, and we're going to look at an S-Corp. These are the only two I want to talk about right now, because they're really only the two that really sort of apply to you guys right here. So in this situation, what happens is this. The couple things that are common about it is you eliminate this issue of liability. That's the biggest thing that's important here for you guys to know, that you eliminate personal debt in this is a liability, and you also eliminate the liability if somebody's hurt. Again, so no matter what happens to your business, if it goes under, for whatever reason, you do not carry that burden as a person. There used to be a group of guys here, they had an uh, advertising agency, they were uh, uh, an LCC, I mean an LLC, and they would open up, they would run business for about six months, they would rack up a huge amount of debt. They would declare bankruptcy on Friday and reopen as a brand new company on Monday morning. And they did it over and over and over and over and over again. And they pocketed all that money. Now, I don't necessarily think that that's a noble way of doing business. And when word gets out that that's the way you do business, it's very hard to keep clients because nobody wants to work with people who do that. But these guys scammed this stuff forever and it was all legal. So anyway, an LCC. The advantage and the reason I think it's the easiest and the best thing for you guys is it's basically one piece of paper you fill out. There's very little that's involved with it other than you have to apply to the state. You can probably do it online. There's probably some, you know, service where you pay 20 bucks and you and, and you just type in all the answers that they're asking you. I mean, it's really incredibly simple to do. And they send it into the state, and then you get designated as an LLC, and you are good to go. All of your business operates under that. You do not have to have annual meetings like a typical corporation does. That doesn't exist. All the income that is generated simply goes through on your tax return, just like it would in a, um, um, a, a sole proprietorship. So there isn't really any additional complication to it. You can fill out your own tax returns if you do your own. If you go to an accountant, they'll do it for you, whatever. But it's not really that much more complex. It's basically a sole proprietorship. It's very cheap to do. You don't have reporting that you have in other corporations. You don't have, there isn't all the legalese. You simply set yourself up for this, and then that's who you operate your business under, uh, and you're good to go. Yes? You can only do that while you're making a certain amount of money. No, that doesn't actually exist here. There is a threshold that you eventually have to meet over a number of years, but the litmus test is not that you're making money, per se. Um, if you're going fast, what, what, what can happen is that if you go for more than five years and you're still, you're only incurring losses over those five years, then they'll start to think about looking at you because they're gonna wonder what it is you're doing. Are you really, is this really business or is this just a really expensive, expensive hobby of yours that you're trying to pass off as a business? Um, but no, there is no threshold limit that's a qualifier or a qualifier for this. So why would you ever switch from now to an LLC? To S corp or C corp. We'll talk about that in just one second. Again, there's a huge tax advantage to doing it. Okay, so does this make sense where we're at right now? So my suggestion to you guys is this is your first step: is that you think about looking into an LLC. Again, 
very inexpensive to put together, very little demands on it other than what you're already doing. You're already doing a tax return, I imagine. If you're not, don't let me know. Now, I, this is a true story. I had a friend, she was a really successful model, and she did not file an income tax return for five years. And she was pulling down over 100 grand a year. But she knew, so she's not filing the return, but she knew she owed the government money. So like just every month or two, whatever, she would just write a check to the government. She would write a check and put her social security number on it and just send it to them. She, and she would just guess, oh, here's $10,000 or here's 20 grand or something. And she did this for five years. And finally, somebody caught on to it. I mean, nothing, no letter, no, not just a check with her social security number on it. <laughs> and they finally audited her. And she came in, and as it turned out, ironically, I mean, if you knew this girl, you, she's, she's, she's the luckiest girl in the world. As it turned out, she was actually really pretty close. She had given them like 80% of what she really owed them. And so they didn't really spank her that hard for the money part of it, but they spanked her really hard for not filing her tax return. They hit her with a whopping penalty for doing that. Um, but at any rate, so yeah, the tax game. Okay, so the difference in this is that, okay, so this starts out, this is very simple to do. Uh, there's no annual meetings. You'll see the stuff right here that it talks about it here. The difference in here. There are no annual meetings. There's uh, very little legal legal expense. Um, however, you do get protection, so liability protection. Um, it's personal tax return is how this is filed. P E R S O. Okay, so that's kind of the long and short of it. You guys can look through the checklist here and see what the other actual differences is. So you get the liability part, the fact that it's created by the state, you don't really care about. Uh, the business uh, distributions can be perpetual, you don't really care about that part either, uh, per se. Uh, down here, uh, uh, you can issue uh, uh, shares of stock to either one. Uh, and then finally, this is the biggie, right? Well, they're all biggies, but uh, this owner's going to report the business profit and loss on their personal tax returns. This is going to become a huge item for us because there is, um, you guys have heard of, of uh, taking advantage of the tax code. I'm going to show you guys how to take advantage of the tax code. So this is kind of the situation again. So you can see with very little effort, basically you'll end up having to do the exact same thing that you already do but you're gonna have this additional protection. In my opinion, that's worth it. However, the bad thing about an LLC, that was an LLC, not an LLC, I, I keep calling it LLC, anyway, never, there's a reason, but I'm gonna get into that. Um, the problem with this guy, though, at the end of the day, and it's the biggest difference between this S corporation, uh, between an LLC and an S corporation is this, is that Everything that you make on here, all the money that you make, all of your profit on this is taxable at your personal rate. So what does that mean? Well, that means most of you guys, I'm guessing, are somewhere in the 15 to 25% tax bracket. That's how much money they take out of whatever you make. In that case, Every single penny that your LLC makes gets taxed at this very same rate. It gets taxed at this personal, whatever it is, the 25%. In an S corporation, that's not the case. And this is where the tax gain comes in. So in an S corporation, there's a couple of differences. In an S corporation, it's far more complex to set this up. C-O-M-P-L-E-X, set up. You usually have to do this with a lawyer, and you also have to do it with an accountant, and that costs money. In most cases. Now, again, there are websites now that you can go to that will say that they can actually do this for you for $500 or 50 bucks or whatever. Uh, I would be a little bit nervous about uh, going uh, that route with it. Because the truth of the matter is, all of the legalese of this happen in an LLC, pretty much you set it up and it takes care of itself the rest of your life, you're good to go. In an S corporation, you have to have annual meetings, you have to issue stock, you have to do, there's a whole set of other issues that you've actually got to go through to actually manage an S corporation that become worth it when you finally reach a certain threshold to make a certain amount of money, and we'll talk about that in just a second, yes. How do you, what do you do in meetings? 
Oh, nothing. They actually, the lawyers just generate a series of meetings that it's just boilerplate and you sign it and it goes into your report, into your book, they file it with the state. You, there's nobody ever meets. Oh, no, that, and yeah. How do you distribute stock? Okay, so we need to talk about corporations and basically how they work. Because I didn't, I, I, so I think some people are very familiar with stock and how it works, some people are not. So we need to talk about that issue really quick. So I'm going to give you just the brief, simple rundown of this. And it works sort of like this. <clears throat> when you decide that you're going to start an S corporation, whatever, you um, basically corporations issue stock, and the stock represents the value of the company. So, in my case, I am a part shareholder. I own shares of stock in my company. My wife own, also owns shares of stock in my company. And basically what those shares do is determine how much uh, uh, um, uh, value each of us has in the company. So in our case, we split it 50-50. So I have 100 shares of stock in my company, my wife has 100 shares of stock in, in the company. Now, typically, if you were to buy stock, like in Apple, what you do is you would actually give them money. You're essentially loaning them money by buying their stock. And in return, they give you stock that is a piece of the company. It's actually a piece of the company. So if they have a million shares, and you buy one share, you own a millionth of the company. So how many should we have any amount of shares? Yes, you can have unlimited. The share number doesn't matter. You do, and that's exactly what you do. Okay. So this is all sort of like just again trying to generate this entity to leverage tax code that's been written. That's basically what we're going to try to do here. So does that make sense? Sort of what's happening with stock. However, as a stockholder, you're actually entitled to profit from the company. So when the company makes money. You own part of the company, right? If you own that one million, so Apple has a million shares. They actually have a whole lot more, but just for easy sake. Apple has a million shares. You buy one share, you own a millionth of the company. Apple makes a million dollars. They owe you a dollar. You're entitled to one millionth of the profit. And they give that to you in dividends. Those dividends are taxed at a flat 15% rate. Does that make sense? OK. It's going to make sense. It's going to be an important player in just a second. So, in the case of an S corporation, it's complex to set it up. There are, uh, and there are annual meetings, and even though nobody gets together, you have to actually pay the lawyer to generate the minutes of the meeting that are then filed with the state. You have to pay to file it with the state. That all happens. That's not just, you have to go through it, right? Typically, in my case, my lawyer just does it. He sends me shit all the time, I sign it. And he probably owns my children and my kidneys right now. But at any rate, I have no idea what he, I just signed shit where he says, yeah. So my mom's a lawyer, so she did that for me. Oh, yeah. Free, and then you just have to pay the file. Yeah, you. which is 50 bucks a year. Okay. Yeah, which is nothing. So yeah, your mom will, <laughs> yeah, is your mom a business lawyer or a, a uh, criminal lawyer? or a, a divorce lawyer. Divorce lawyer? Yeah. She'll know enough about this. Yeah. Yeah. So at any rate. You can draw a little business here. I'll everybody here can put your mom in the <laughs> She can do a package deal of LLC. Okay. Um, so the other issue that's involved in this is that there's not little expense. There is expenses that are involved in this, and they are legal and accounting. So typically, what it cost me, it cost me um, $7,000 to set up my S corporation. That was the cost to actually make it. In terms of keeping it going every single year, it's probably around three or four thousand dollars in legal fees a year to continue to do that. My accounting fees, because I also have an accountant do all of this, because it starts to get much more complex when you do a S corporation, also runs about two thousand dollars a year to do. So my overall legal and accounting end up being somewhere in the, I'm going to say seven eight thousand dollars a year range. So let's just say that this is, um, we'll just say eight thousand dollars, and we'll see how it plays out. So $8,000 a year to actually do this part. Uh, in terms of the liability protection, you get the same thing. So that part's great. Um, the personal tax return, this changes. So what ends up happening now is that you actually need to file a corporate return. So your S corporation has to file a return with the feds and the state vote. So now if you are in Illinois, you have four tax returns. You have two for your uh, for the S corporation if you're doing it, and then two for your personal. So the S corporation does fed and state, you do fed and state. In an LLC, it's just 
two returns. It's yours to the state and yours to the feds. But so we've now doubled it. The income, though, from your S corporation is actually reflected on your um, um, on your personal tax return, and this is where the tax I want to call this a tax scam, but this is where the tax benefit actually comes in, and I'm going to show you guys how this basically works. Okay, so is this are we clear about this so far? Are there questions about this so far? Uh, the portion down here is the profit here. All the profit oh, in an okay, LLC okay. is taxed at your personal rate. On the S one. Oh, this one, liability yeah. protection. Okay. Okay, so this is, we're going to do an example here, a what if example, and you'll sort of see how this part actually works. So, you've got an LLC. And you make $100,000 in one year. And that's your net. You actually, you, you, you were in business, you had, you actually billed $150,000, but you had $50,000 in expenses. So your taxable is um, uh, $100,000. Does that make sense? We'll talk about expenses and income in just a second. But let's, your taxable income is $100,000, right? So then this gets kicked onto your personal tax return. And this is the only thing you're doing. You're not working for anybody else. It just gets put in your personal tax return. At $100,000, you're in a 33% tax bracket. So you're 33, you would actually be paying $33,000 in taxes because you're in a 33% tax bracket. So your net in this is $67,000. That's what you come away with. You actually made $100,000, but you just gave the government $33,000 of it. Is there any question about what I'm showing you on this board right now? Simple, right? So now, in an S corporation, the very same thing happens. So an S corp, this is what happens. It's the same $100,000. However, you work for this company. This is not your $100,000. This is the S Corp's $100,000. You work for that company. Again, this is an entity separate from you. And in working for that company, oh, I can't, we haven't finished this. We haven't finished this. We haven't finished it. I'm sorry, this is not complete here. That $100,000 taxed at your personal tax rate, this is your 33% tax bracket. However, you've also got a Social Security and uh, Medicare that comes out of this. Social Security and Medicare that you're personally responsible for, that's another 15%. It's actually a little bit higher. Is it 15% of what is after the first tax or is it added on to the... So it's they tax. look at it and they base it all on the 100000 Yeah. So it's like 157 but we're just going to keep it at 15% just to keep the math simple here. You guys okay with that? It's close. So your FICA is what they call it. And you'll see that on, uh, you see it on every single W-2 you get. You see it on every single paycheck you get. They take out money for Social Security and money for Medicare, right? That's called FICA. Um, so that's 15%. So that's another $15,000 that's out of this. Does anybody have a calculator handling? This is going to become complicated. Um, I was down to 67. Uh, that would take me to 62 to $52,000 is what you then net. Yeah, got to love it, right? So that's in an LLC situation. In an S corporation, we're going to do the exact same thing, but an S corporation, the best thing about an S corporation, or the trick to it is, this is the scam. Again, I keep, I shouldn't use that word scam. If I get audited because this YouTube video goes, you know, I'm going to, I love you guys, every one of you, equally. In an S corporation, this is the trick. This is the tax trick that you do. In an S corporation, in a my corporation, it's exactly what I do. I pay myself a salary. The company pays me to be the principal photographer and the president of the company. They pay me $6,000 a year to do that. So my salary is $6,000. I'm going to do this calculation over here. So my salary is $6,000. The taxable part of a $6,000 salary is 15%. So what's 15% of $6,000? $900? That's what I pay in tax. 
I also have FICA on this that's going to run exactly the same thing, $900. Again, it's close to 15%. So out of my salary, I lose $1,800. So my take after all of that, my salary is $4,200. That's what I come away with, right? However, what's left of this is $94,000. That's what ends up being, that's what remains. And once you subtract my salary from this, there's $94,000 remain. Does that make sense? I take this entire $94,000, I take it all as a dividend. It reduces the profit of the S corporation to zero, so the corporation does not make any money because it's zeroed out every single year. So I pay no corporate tax on it at all. The $94,000 then is a dividend and it's taxed at a 15% dividend rate. Remember we were just talking about stock 20 minutes ago? What you pay the tax on stock dividends is 15% flat. So what's 15% of $94,000? You guys are gonna force me to go to a calculator. I can see one of you's got one. Multiply 94,000 times uh, uh, 0.15. 14,100, we're just gonna leave it at 14 to make the math easy, right? So after the, all the taxes are paid, so this is my dividend tax, all my taxes are paid, this 14,000 comes off of this, this ends up being $80,000 is what I net on the dividend plus the $42,000 that I got as salary. So I've made $84,200. Would you rather make $84,200 or $52,000? Now, there's one last hit in this. I have to pay for my lawyer and the legal expenses out of this. Remember that $8,000 I told you about? I'm gonna lose that $8,000. That's gonna come out of this as well. So at the end, I make $76,200 as opposed to $52,000. That's, uh, if we look at the difference, the difference in $52,000, uh, forget the $200 part of it, uh, or $24,000 $24, more as an S corporation. Did you guys learn that in your business class? Nope. <laughs> so, like, since, like, you won't have your business, and your wife won't have your business, so that? No, we're married, so we fell on the same return. Oh, okay. So, it, so you would, it's just, it, doing this by yourself would work the same way. Okay. So, so, as an S corporation, you have to have uh, stocks. You can't own all of the stocks. No, you could. Is you have one person can own 100% of the stock. Oh, so it, it would, the math ends up being exactly the same. But yeah, so, so what's then, the point of having stocks in it where you're feeling 100%? Because you are taking the money out as a dividend as opposed oh. to an income. This is the game. This is the S Corp game that everybody plays. I'm confused. So then, is that my <laughs> No. But it could I be, own the company. It could be if you wanted it. So you could keep the money in the And most people do. They would just put it right back in. They would loan it right back to the company at the end of the year. But you take it out so that the company's income is zeroed out so that the company pays no taxes. I, what ended up happening was that after my salary was paid, the company still had $94,000 in cash. If I left it in there, the company would have to pay tax on that, corporate tax, which is much higher. Instead, I take it all out as a dividend. I pay 15% on it. There's nothing left in the company. So you take it out so quarter and Yes, exactly. Oh. So, so is that 15% of the dividend taken out when you file your personal tax? Exactly. Okay. That's where the personal, the dividend tax is paid on my personal tax return. But this is a $24,000 boost on the same amount of money. Even with the legal expense. This is that becomes the tricky part about this. As your business continues to grow, do you then hire people and bring and treat them as employees, or are, do they basically stay as freelance? Because that becomes a big issue. If you hire somebody as a full time employee, if your company hires a full time person, right? then you are obligated to them for all sorts of things. They are actually have a right to share in part of the profit here. They also, you owe them also other things like um, uh, you would owe them health insurance and you would owe them uh, other things depending on, again, the number of people. 
So what most people in my case do, and what's going to happen to all of you guys, is you're never hired full time. You're actually hired on uh, as um, um, a work for hire. You're never somebody who, uh, this is an issue that happens with uh, domestic uh, help all the time with maids. If you've got somebody that you're hiring that's there at your house three days a week, every single week for the whole year, whatever, the government looks at that and says, that's an employee of yours. That's not a freelancer. Um, but if you are a freelancer, whatever, then you're not entitled to any of that, which goes to a bigger issue. That's why when you guys start working for any company that you go out for any of the studios or in town, that kind of whatever, it gets complicated because they don't want to treat you as a full-time employee. They want to treat you is work for hire so that they don't have to pay any benefits to you and you don't get to participate in any of this. So if you do have a full-time employee, how much of the profit do they get? I would never have a full-time employee. It just is off the table. But if you did, how much are they entitled to? It would all depend on how much they're getting, how much money that they're making, how much salary that they're making. All of this then would come out of that. So let's say you're paying them because you can't clearly, you're not going to pay them $6,000 a year. I pay myself $6,000 a year because the government requires you to pay yourself something. And what they call it, this is a really interesting thing. I'm just going to read to you what they call this, what the government says. So the government says... Shareholders should pay attention to paying themselves a reasonable, in air quotes, reasonable salary for the work they perform for the S Corp. So what's reasonable? Well, I'm claiming as little as I can, but do you think $6,000 a year is a reasonable salary for anybody? No. I haven't gotten called on it yet. <laughs> so you want so to get as low as you can? Then? You need to get as low as you can because the less money you pay yourself in salary, the more that gets diverted to as a dividend. So, how much can you get away with? I I incorporated in 1987. It's worked every year so far. <laughs> okay. Do you just pay yourself back? Yeah. Say what? Do you make more than that? Do I make more than this? Yeah. Yes. So, but there's a hook in this. There's a hook in this. So it's not all like rosy here. So we're going to look at a different scenario right here. So, but the basic, are there questions about this basic math about what I'm really trying to do here? Basically, what I'm trying to do is as an S corporation, I can take money and divert it to, I label the money, the income, I'm labeling it as a dividend. I'm not just labeling it, I'm actually going through, I'm, I'm doing tax returns, I'm doing all the shit to make sure that this is legitimately a dividend that is paid to me so that I only have to pay 15% on the money. And this happens if I, I could triple this money, and it's still the the, the you know the three hundred thousand dollars. My tax rate on that money would still be fifteen percent. I would not be up at the thirty eight percent tax rate. That's the highest tax rate that we have in the United States right now. Thirty nine. You're right. You're right. I wouldn't be thirty nine percent. I would never get there for the dividend part. The dividend part is always going to be at fifteen percent, at least until they change the tax code. So does that make sense? The what I'm trying to do here, the deal. So here, I'm going to show you, the, and I'm going to show you the downside right now, and it'll become apparent. Because everyone's like, no, I'll, I'll, no, just do LLC as for it's too complicated. Like, don't do it, don't do it. I'm Again, it all depends on the level of your income. Right. So I'm going to show you the difference now and when this would actually make. So we're going to look at the same same scenario, but with much less money. Okay. So I just picked hundred thousand dollars arbitrarily, but let's actually look at it in more like a forty thousand dollar game, and let's see how the math goes down with that. I really probably should have done this already ahead of time. I have no idea how this is going to work out. I really don't. Okay, so forty thousand dollars. We're going to say, and in forty thousand dollars, you're probably in a, a twenty-five percent tax bracket. You're probably not in thirty-one. So a quarter of this is going to be uh, uh, would be uh, ten thousand dollars. I still need fifteen. So that's my tax. I still need fifteen percent of that to actually pay for the FICA. So the FICA. Is 50, what's fifteen percent of six thousand? Thank you. My tax rate in my income tax, state and debt, twenty five percent. So twenty five percent tax rate, and then my FICO, which is fifteen percent. Um. So when I subtract all of this, whatever, I come up with thirty twenty four thousand dollars. That's what I take home, right? 
Okay, we're going to do the same thing in an S corporation. We start out with 40. I do the same calculation over here. I'm still going to take out my $6,000. I'm still going to pay um, 900 in uh, tax and another 900 in FICA, which gives me, again, the same $42,000. That part doesn't change at all. So uh, the $6,000 gets subtracted from his, so this leaves me $36,000 as dividend. 36000 uh, is a dividend. I pay 15% on that. Can you do 15%? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Sorry. You're right. 34000 uh, dollars I'm sorry. And then the tax on it? 25 percent right? Oh, 25%. Yeah, we're doing this at a 25 percent tax rate. But I'm sorry, we're doing 15 percent of this. Oh, yeah. What am I talking about? 15% of 34000 dollars So this is my dividend, uh, my uh, tax rate. Yeah. Yeah, 5000 5000 So I subtract that and end up with 29000 Yeah. So I end up with 29000 I can add the 42000 back into this because this is still money that I've got. So if I add the Four thousand back into this, it ends up being thirty-three thousand dollars, thirty-three thousand two hundred. But I still have eight thousand dollars in legal and accounting expenses. So when I subtract the eight thousand from this, it ends up being what? Twenty-five thousand. Twenty-five thousand two hundred dollars. Um, so that's the difference. In this case, right now, I'm only making one thousand two hundred dollars more going through all this hassle. But if you could see, if you drop that to $35,000, all of a sudden you would make more money being an LLC than you will make being an S corporation. There's a flipping point where the cost of being an S corporation uh, becomes viable. And most people put that figure around $60,000. So if you were making less than $60,000, in most cases, you're better off doing an LLC. When you get above that, you are better off doing an S corporation. And certainly by the time you start getting up into the 120, 150, 100, 200,000, 250, that range, you are clearly better off doing this as an S corporation. Does this make sense? Yeah. So at what point did they make you become a C corp? In New York, it was just, uh, again, it was the way they actually looked at it. They really, New York really, New York, I understand, everybody understands that this is going on. This is why everybody does it. That's the only reason people do it. Um, and they were really looking to generate tax revenue. So in their case, they get to they look at your business and they simply tell you what it is you can and can't do. And you keep petitioning for it. You So we went in and said, we want to get registered in the state of New York as an S corporation. And they came back and said, you can't. I, I, they, you, they, don't really, they don't really get into that much of it. They cite all sorts of reasons. But... Um, yeah, but that's basically the long and short of it. What's interesting about in New York, though, that gets even more so is that in New York, you have an additional tax. In New York, you have a city income tax of 10%. So again, trying to get more money diverted out is general income and more is dividend income. You're not paying that in a city in an income tax. So were you an S-Corp before you moved? Yeah, I've always been an S-Corp in Illinois. That's where my first corporation was here. I incorporated here. Um, I opened New York in, in um, 1999. So, so I had already been 12 years here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What if you work? Oh, yeah. So, okay. No, no. All interesting questions. So, <laughs> international is a little more complex. We can actually talk about that, but unless anybody's here is really getting ready to move <laughs> international. Um, what if you go for like one job or something? If you go for one job, you don't really have to worry about it too much. Here's the deal and the way that actually New York treats it. Um, what ended up happening, the thing that prompted all of this was professional sports. So just another reason to hate professional sports. No, I, just, I actually <laughs> like some professional sports. But um, what ended up happening was that you had football players who were going to other cities and making millions of dollars. And those other states said, well, you're making all this money. You're, you know, the... Texas team comes here and plays at Soldier Field, and they say, well, you guys, you've made your $5 million in that game. You did it in Illinois. We want it. You have to file an income tax return. 
And that actually happens. If you play professional sports, you have to file a tax return in every state that you play a game in. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, of course they do. Yeah, I mean, they're not, yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, yeah, not going there, right? Yeah, okay, but yeah, um, so, yeah. Um, uh, uh, so what happens in New York is this. The biggest problem for me in New York, I could, when I lived in Chicago, I had a studio here. When I did the studio, when I opened the studio in New York, I still had the studio here. I had a house here, a studio here, and I had a studio there that I lived in. The living there part is what complicates it. That's when they actually say at that stage of the game, you are living here and you're working here, you have to file tax returns here. That was different than when I would fly into New York for one day or two days here in Chicago and then I would claim all that income here in Chicago. Now, they could still have gone after me and they could have hauled me into tax court and said, well, he was only, he was flying in and out, he didn't have a house here, uh, and who knows how it would have gone down. But the minute I actually had a house there, that gets figured into your tax calculation. So what ends up happening if you have multiple places like that is it's not, they don't just look at the job you did there and, okay, all the jobs that he did in New York are taxed for New York. And all the stuff that he did in Illinois is taxed in Illinois. They don't look at it that way. What they look at is, that's part of the calculation, but then they also look at the money that you're spending in rent in both places because that is used to establish how much time or investment you've really got in those places. So that figures into the calculation as well. So conceivably, you could do no jobs in New York, but because you had an apartment there or a studio there, you would have to pay taxes on the money you earned everywhere else. So you'd have to pay taxes for both New York and Chicago? What ends up happening is that they split it up. So you have a certain tax liability, but again, the city tax is additional in New York. Um, Chicago doesn't care about that, or Illinois doesn't care about it, and the feds don't care about it either. Are there questions about this? So I, I realize that there's a lot of, this can be confusing, but at its simplest terms, think of it this way. The one carry way that I want you guys to have from tonight is this. A sole proprietorship is a very dangerous thing for you to do in our business. If you were a CPA and accountant, it wouldn't really matter. How much trouble are you going to get when you drop your pencil on the ground? <laughs> right? How much trouble, you know, are you really going to get when the client comes to your office and he steps on the cat? I mean, it's just, it's just not the nature of the business to be that nervous about that kind of thing, right? But that is not what we do. What we do is actually fraught with the possibility of huge damage, either physically or money. You do, you shoot the wedding. And you didn't know that your sensor in your camera was not recording anything because you didn't bother to check during the whole thing. And at the end of the day, you don't have a single picture. And they sue you for that. Well, that changes the whole game. That's, you know, my, my accountant is now, I'm never gonna sue my accountant for, oh, you left out, you know, item number 89 on column four. I, that's just not gonna happen, right? There's certain things that carry more liability than others, and photography, in my opinion, is one of them. And a freelance career is certainly a liability when it comes to money. So. My suggestion is that the LLC becomes clearly the thing that you consider first. And then again, once you start getting into that fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar range, and we're talking about net now income, at that stage of the game, you need to sit down with an accountant would be my suggestion um, and do the numbers and say, at what point does this become financially a better deal for me? to do, because in most cases, once you reach that point, and hopefully every year of your career, you're going, every year, every next year is going to be better than the year before. So once you reach that threshold, hopefully it'll make sense to stay there, because you're gonna to continue to make more money and more money and more money and more money. Does this make sense? But I'm telling you guys, this is how the big boys play this. Now every single person in this room is capable of understanding this, and everybody in this room is capable of leveraging this. $24,000 can mean one hell of a party, <laughs> at the very least, right? Okay.
Um, really quickly, I want to jump into something else here. We don't have too much longer, guys. We only got a, another half hour of pain and misery. Um, I want to talk about income and expenses so that we uh, possibly have a little bit better idea of this. If you go back to our Moodle site, I've actually given you my list of income, expense, and categories. If you click on that guy, it'll open up and you can actually take a look at it. Now, some of these things may or may not make sense to you, and I'll describe to you why I have uh, different things, and we'll talk about um, possible other. There's another tax um, strategy. That's what we're going to call it. Doesn't that sound better than scam, right? It sounds more legitimate, right? Isn't that what, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a tax strategy. I'm going to talk to you guys about another tax strategy in just a second. Uh, okay, but I want to get actually to talking about expenses and income. So in the whole game of this, what ends up happening is it's not, when they talk about what they tax your income on, it's not the money that you actually are paid. That's not what it's all about. It's the money that you're paid minus what it really costs you to actually do that work. Um, so what we were looking for is a net amount. So in my case, and I'll go through these categories really quick. If you look up at the top, I've got income categories for me. I have um, photo expenses. Now, I, I typically use, and I would suggest, oh, let me, actually, I'm going to jump back real quick. You guys don't need to do this, but I'm going to go back and um, uh, just show you one thing. There is a link here for Quicken. It is a um, $79 accounting program. There's an, also a link here for an accounting program called Fresh Books. Um, there are other ones out there that exist. Um, uh, I don't necessarily, I'm not advocating necessarily one or the other, um, but I am strongly advocating that you've got to use some system of tracking your, your income and your expenses, yes. Yeah, fresh books. I use that, but just for one company, multiple companies want to use that. Okay. And I like they want to call them and be like, I'm only using it for one company. You said thing for one company, so you could like make it for one company and send it to yourself. And then you oh. Have, like an account and it's free. I don't care. Okay. But uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So you have a fresh books. Yeah. 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 Ye
I only check my fees in New York. I know all my photo expenses are run through the corporation in Illinois. So if I pay for a hotel in New York, or if I pay for a model in New York, or if I pay for lunch or dinner, or whatever, catering, whatever it is, that's not considered an income that I do in New York. It's all run through Chicago. So I accept the fact that I have to declare my photo fees there, but that's the only thing I'm declaring to them. Then there is uh, sales tax, and this is an income. If you charge sales tax, you make money. That is an income. You now have to turn around and give it back to the state, but it's still an income. Does that make sense? So I've got in the state of Illinois, if you charge a 10% sales tax, uh, it's close to 10% now, you have a $100,000 shooting, that would be a $10,000 tax, sales tax. You would bill the client for $110,000, you would collect that $10,000, that is income. But then you turn right around and send it out as an expense as well, because you send that right back out to the state. So for you guys, it's a, it ends up being a wash. Make sense? Okay, so I keep that part separate. Processing as income. It used to be in the state of Illinois, and this is actually a great one. You had, there was a specific code that was written in the state of Illinois tax code that photographers had to charge sales tax on processing. Not on your work, not on your shooting fees, not on your assistant fees, not on your seamless costs, not on that. You had to charge it on processing. So we all had to go out and register with the state. You'd have to register to get a sales tax certificate. And then you had to collect sales tax on your film processing cost. And everybody said, what a colossal pain in the ass. Because you have to file an income, you have to file a sales tax return. So I'm going to say to each and every one of you, you guys have to do that. And you're going to say to me, fuck that. Why would I ever do that? Tax strategy number two. With a sales certificate, every single thing that you do in photography is exempt from sales tax. You go buy a camera from Central Camera, you pay no sales tax. You buy a lens from Calumet, you pay no sales tax. You buy Seamless from whoever, you pay no sales tax. You buy, any, you buy a computer from Micro Center, no sales tax. You buy hard drives from Micro Center, no sales tax. USB drives, no sales tax. You buy the monitor you wanted to retouch that you've always wanted to do, you pay no sales tax. The downside, you have to pay sales tax on your processing. How many people in this room have any processing cost at all? Who's the last time any of you processed a roll of film? Hmm. A couple of weeks ago, so some of you still do some film, right? Do you only shoot film? No. You can, but that's got nothing to do with what the state is asking you to pay tax, sales tax on. So here's the deal. Film processing that you will never ever do again in your life for the most part. You will never charge sales tax ever again in your life, but you get to avoid paying sales tax on everything that you do remotely related to your business. You get a sales tax certificate from the state and everybody that you buy shit from, you say, here's my sales tax certificate, I am exempt. And they go, yep, we'll put you in your system. So Micro Center has got me in their system. Calumet, I'm in their system. Central Camera, I'm in their system. You email them with a copy of your sales tax certificate and you say, I need sales tax exempt status. And they say, okay. Every business in the world is doing this. Yes, you guys thought I was just going to lead you down the boring lane. Oh, that fucker is going to drone on all night long about this shit. He's not going to save me any money at all. And I've just given you one of the greatest of all. You want the new computer? You damn well better get a sales tax certificate before you buy it. Yeah. How long does it usually take to get this certificate? I really, now that's actually, I don't, I frankly, I don't know the answer to that because I did this back in 1980 something. And then how do you do that? Do you, do you just apply, yeah, I'm sure, that, I'm sure, yeah, there's just Google sales tax certificate apply application, state of Illinois. It's not that involved. Um, I would suggest you do your LLC or your S corporation before you do your sales tax thing because it'll be in the name of your corporation. Make sense? Okay, so that's how, and then I've got one last thing here. I used to actually rent my studio out and people would pay me 
to rent my studio, that's again, is the income that I would actually run through the corporation. So the other trick here is anything that you can run through the corporation, you want to run through the corporation uh, once you get to the S Corp stage, because again, you still then leverage that whole other tax strategy that we were talking about, where you're declaring your income as dividend, not as general income. Make sense? All right, I've put thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into each of your pockets tonight. <laughs> you thought that people should be awake and jumping up and down and going like this. Uh, so expenses. What are expenses that you can actually legitimately write off? So you'll look at my list right here, and it's to give you some idea of what you can actually write off. There's a couple of things in here that won't really make sense to you probably initially. Um, these 401k contributions wouldn't really apply to you guys in the initial part. They might apply to you later on. This bad debt is misleading. Um, this isn't something that really happens uh, in terms of the setup and how uh, we'll, we'll talk about what that is in just a second. But things like catering, rec commissions, computer expenses, computer expenses are ink, inkjet printers, paper, all that kind of stuff, any of that stuff that you buy. Those are all expenses that you need, that you incur to have to run your business. And they are all subtracted from your income. So this is how this part works. So let's say you've got $100,000 in income. I'm sorry I just keep picking that number, but it's an easy one to do the math with. Okay, and let's say with this hundred thousand dollars of income, you're in your thirty-three percent bracket. I'm not going to deal with the FICA stuff right now. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to look at basic tax structure. Let's just say you got your thirty-three percent in tax, and so your taxes are going to be thirty-three thousand dollars, and you end up with sixty-seven thousand dollars. That's what you can end up. Um, that's the money that you end up making, right? So let's look at another scenario and talk about how. Uh, expenses will actually end up affecting this whole uh, calculation right here. So let's say you've got $100,000 in expenses and you have $50,000, I'm sorry, $100,000 in income and $50,000 in expenses. So this is income, this is expenses. That gives you a net of $50,000. That's what you ended up with. That's what was uh, actually, that's what you're going to be taxed on. So then you do 33% of $50,000, and it ends up being exactly half of this, which would be 16,000. Can you do math? What's half of 30? Or just do 33% um, uh, um, uh, of $50,000. 16,000. Oh, sorry. 16, um, let's actually do a simpler example. No, it's just simpler in math. Okay, $10,000 in expenses. So you subtract the $10,000, so these are expenses. You end up with $90,000 that's taxable income. Your 33% of this is uh, uh, $27,000. That's not quite right. It's 29. 29. 29 what? Seven. Seven, and then can you subtract that from the 90000 I'm going to go on a limb and... Uh, $60,000. i am sorry, $60,000. That was 33% of that, right? Okay, so... Yeah. Uh, anyway, so this is basically the situation of how this works. So you can see that if you've got $10,000 in expenses right here, it does not reduce your tax bill by $10,000. What it does is it reduces your tax bill by whatever tax bracket you are in. So, for instance, if you have a $10,000 expense and you're in a 33% tax bracket, you can remove that $10,000 from your income. So that $10,000 doesn't get hit with the 33,000, I mean with the 33% tax. So essentially the way to figure it is this. The government will pay your expenses in whatever bracket you're in. That's how much they'll pay of your expense. So in a 33% tax bracket, a $10,000 expense, the government will pay $3,300 of that. You pay the rest. Does that make sense? Because you're removing this $10,000 from the income. You're saying that you're not going to tax me on the $10,000 anymore. So. The tax would have been 
in a 33% bracket would have been $3,300 on this 10,000. 33% of this 10,000 is $3,300. So that's what the government pays. So the way you always figure it is this. Whatever expense you've got, the government will pay whatever bracket you're in. Is that a simpler way of thinking about it? So you have a $100,000 expense and you're in a 25% tax bracket. The government will pay $25,000 of it. You pay $75,000 of it. Make sense? I'm getting a lot of no's here. And I'm getting nobody's willing to commit to this. <laughs> I, think, I think we've hit terminal burnout in numbers is what I think has happened here. Yeah, I don't get the whole will pay 33% of it. Okay, let's look at it in another way. And and then we'll 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 move on to something else. <clears throat> let's do smaller numbers. Let's do ten thousand hmm? dollars. Okay. Ten thousand dollars. Um so uh again a quarter of ten thousand dollars would be uh two thousand five hundred dollars, right? So twenty five percent. 25% of this <coughs> equals $2,500. So that's what the government gets is $2,500, and you get $7,500. That's what you're left with, right? Okay, let's cut this in half. Let's say you have a $5,000 expense. So I've got $5,000 expense. I still made the 10,000 was what I was bringing in. So actually I make $5,000. So again, 25% of $5,000 is uh, 1,250. And I end up uh, taking home uh, three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars on that, right? So the difference in this, so this five thousand dollars expense took my tax burden uh, from here, this fifteen hundred dollars, down to this twelve. It actually just cut that part in half, right? So again, when I look at my tax burden here, that part is right. Yeah. So out of this five thousand dollars expense, the government gave me. $1,250 of it. This $5,000 expense reduced my tax burden by $1,250. So you're just not paying taxes on that $5,000. Exactly, because it was an expense. That expense gets removed from my income. So it's no longer taxed. It's not in my income. But what I save on my taxes is not the $5,000. I don't get, if I have a $5,000 expense, I don't take $5,000 off my final tax bill. What I take off of it is what the government would have taxed that money at the rate it would have been, which is $1,250. So again, whatever your expense is, however big it is, or small, what the government will pay of that expense is your tax rate. Make more sense? So could you make write-ups all the way up to ten thousand dollars? Oh, you can go beyond that. You can actually lose money. You can't do it for too long, but you can do it for up to five years in a row. Oh, if you're a C Corp, you can go in infinitely longer than that. You know Amazon has never turned a profit. They continue to invest far more heavily in, than what they make. But their business is, is, is it's exploded. The value of their business is gigantic. But they've never turned a profit. Not one yet. Is it because of like the or is it because No, because every time they you know, Jeff Bezos makes a hundred billion dollars and he spends two hundred billion dollars on generating the whole next, you know, Set of you know distribution centers and the, the next drone program and the next you know well we're going to get into local stores now and local delivery now so you've got a hundred thousand trucks that are you know yeah but again the value of that business is completely outweighing the issue about profit that's what he's saying he's saying yeah I keep losing money but the value of our business is exploding so I'm losing a million dollars a day. But, um, but the value of our business is it's growing at $5 billion a day. 
So we're actually better off. So does that mean the investors are not getting any dividends? So no, that does mean that. And it's not that they're not getting any dividends. They are, um, but the real issue is their stock value is going up. So they don't really get dividends because there is no profit, but the value of their stock keeps doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling. So if they sell it, they're making a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. We'll crank it down now here for just a little bit. Yeah, we'll talk about one last thing really quickly here. Um, I know you guys are a little bit fried right now. So I'm going to try to kind of kick things back <clears throat> to something that's a little bit simpler. Um, think about this stuff over the next week. If you are still on the fence about this the next week, we can go through this a second time because a lot of times I find that, again, with fresh mind, going into this a second time, whatever. But what I can say to you is this, is that this is how... These are the things that you need to embrace if you expect to actually have a business that you can sustain. Because I think, I'm afraid right now, what your idea, what most of your all's idea, not all, I don't want to, because I don't know you, but most of your idea, what your business is about is basically this. I make money, I spend money, and whatever's left over is a good thing. And if nothing's left over, I can't make my bill payments, I go into credit card debt. And that's your life. I fundamentally want to change that part. I want you to leverage every possible thing that you can leverage. I want you to keep more of your money. The more of it you can keep, the better off you're going to be. The less likely that scenario is going to get. So these things become an issue for us. So let me ask you this. In spite of this math right here, forget this part. Is the whole idea that expenses get removed from your income before it is taxed? Does that make sense to all of you guys? That's sort of the easy part, right? I made $100,000, but it cost me $50,000 in business. So what's left over is what's taxed. The difference in those two. Is that? Is anybody still struggling with that guy? So for instance, you have to pay your accountant. Well, your accountant takes the, whatever you're paying your accountant, that gets removed from your income because you had to pay the accountant to be in business. Right? You had to buy a new camera. That comes off of your income. You had to hire an assistant for a photo shoot. That comes out of your income because that's money you're not making. Somebody pays you to do a job, $1,000, but you have to hire a $200 a day assistant to do the job. You pay the 200 bucks, that comes out of the $1,000 that they paid you. You make $800. It's that simple. Are we good on that? Okay, so that part actually works. And so this list that I've given you is actually a really good list of the things that you guys should be considering taking off. These are all legitimate expenses that you guys, if you have to fix your camera, that is a legitimate expense. So what is not a legitimate expense? Yes. It is not able to be a write-off. Personal wardrobe is not, but wardrobe that you need to rent to do an advertising shooting is. Okay, so so this see. wardrobe category that sits right here, this is not my wife's latest coat. <laughs> this is the wardrobe that I had to either buy or rent to do the, uh, again, you don't do it for uh, fashion shootings, but you do it for advertising shootings. So. When I'm shooting for General Motors. They go, a stylist goes out and rents or buys all the clothes that they wear, and that is wardrobe and that is a deductible expense. But we couldn't, like, like for weddings, you have to dress nice. You couldn't. That is personal. Right. No, but if you were, let's say, you were, yeah, you decided that you were going to become a specialist in horror wedding photography, and you went out and bought a bunch of prop dresses. They were all slashed up and covered in blood that you could use for your business. That is not your personal wardrobe. That is wardrobe that would be legitimate for your business. So if you became a boudoir photographer and you went out and bought five thousand dollars worth of lingerie that you're not wearing, it's not your lingerie. It's not personal. It's stuff for your business. The business owns that lingerie. Um, then you can deduct that. What happens if you buy something for a shoot, and then what happens with it afterwards? 
tax strategy number three. <laughs> So if I buy a pair of Jimmy shoes for a shoe, yes. and I use them, yes. and then whatever happens to them afterwards, that's a strategy? In theory, if you return the shoes and get the money back for it, legally you would have basically the expenses is, is, is a wash. You paid $1,500 for the shoes, which took them back, and you got the $1,500 back. It's basically if they got damaged, then the... Uh, the damage, the difference in the two, they said, okay, we're only gonna give you $1,000 for these because it's gonna cost $500 to fix them. That is a legitimate expense for you. And that's not even something you have to actually figure out because what ends up happening is that you pay the $1,500, that's your uh, that's your expense. They give you $1,000 back, that is income. The two offset one another and there's a $500 expense that remains at the end. So what if they're good and you just bought them? And, and gave them to your girlfriend? I what I. Again, as long as you didn't get any money back for it, it's still a legitimate expense. So I'm going to throw another one out to you guys. I don't, I can't remember the last vacation I took that wasn't uh, actually to build my location portfolio. You guys came here expecting something. And my guess is what you didn't come here for was me to give you a pep talk about doing your elevator pitch, even though that that's got to be a part of it. So we're at this stage of the game. We've got 10 minutes left. Do you want me to show you the quickest way in the world to save $4,000? Yeah. You can't do this as a student, because as a student, you actually are considered, although it's really weird how they work that part out. Um, in order to do this, you actually have to have a business, so you actually have to have income to be doing this. So it can't be that as a student, you're a photographer and you've shot a couple of concerts and you made a couple hundred bucks. You can't turn around and do what I'm going to show you right now. It's got to be once you sort of have a reasonably legitimate thing going on, right? So, but you're legitimate, you're, you're, the, the thing that you've actually going on, um, we do calculations for me, please? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just so that we can do it really quick. Um, my account, my original account, who's unfortunately died uh, since, he was, uh, he was such a brilliant guy. He, my very first day, and this is one thing I will say to you about accountants, is that uh, everybody's up for negotiation, and what I would strongly suggest, I don't, I'm not, I'm actually very good at math, um, I'm very good at numbers and multiple letters, but good at numbers. Um, I don't want to do that work. When I was actually had everything going in New York, I was doing, this is the number of tax returns that I do. So federal, state, times, five for the corporation because I had to do quarterly returns. I did the same thing in New York. I counted this up once. At the end of the day, I was doing 36 tax returns a year. I don't do that. My accountant does it. So the deal that I've always, and the thing I'll suggest you make with the accountant is that my accountant, it was a deal he made with me. He looked at me once and he said, first, sir, I will save you more money than I'll cost you. And I said, okay. And he did. And this was the first thing that he showed me. So some of this depends on what you own, but nonetheless, if you have a car, you're actually entitled to a car wash, the maintenance on your car. You get your car washed, it's ten dollars a pop to get your car washed, and you do it every week. That's five hundred dollars, isn't it? Fifty times ten. That's five hundred dollars in your car washes. Everything that you can imagine to do with photography, you now get to write off. Everything, and you need to be aggressive about this. So, what does that mean? What impacts your business? You are supposed to have receipts for everything. Receipts. Like, when I was modeling during like modeling show, like, I would keep every receipt for like water bottles or something. But I which you should. Which you should. So I'm temporarily going to turn off the audio. Your fucking graphics arts people. 
how hard is it for you to generate a receipt? <laughs> That's even better. Then you build yourself for the graphic arts work to generate the bogus receipt. Hello. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so $500 in car washes is what you can knock off. Okay, so what can you legitimately write off with the receipts? Because you're right about the whole receipt thing. Um, everything that you can imagine that affects your photography. Your cable bill, you write it off because cable is critical to your visual thinking. <laughs> Wait, no, you laugh at this. This is absolutely the God's honest truth. Every magazine that you buy, Every newspaper that you buy, every play that you go to see, you, you think I'm kidding? You can write your Hamilton tickets off. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. You, the, the, the criteria that the IRS says is that it has to have a legitimate impact on your business. This is visual research for you guys. You don't think that they... Steven Spielberg sends a crew out to actually look all over Hawaii for the place to shoot his next film. You don't think he's not knocking those expenses off? You're damn right, he's paying for the helicopter and everything else. All of that is written off, and it's all legitimate for you guys as well. Now, I'm not suggesting anything illegal, um, but legitimate, and you need to really start thinking in broad thoughts about what is legitimate. Every possible visual experience that you can have is a legitimate write-off. It it's informing your visual, everything about your visual, every book that you buy, every everything that you would do that is related to that is a legitimate expense. I write off all of my cable. I write off all of my internet. I write off all of my all of that. It is all material that I need to do what I do. The books that I get, the magazines that I get, all of that stuff. It's all written off. Look at my list. There's <laughs> magazines and video in here someplace. Movies and videos right here. That's what I'm saying. This is a good list for you to think of. So, that being said, every single day you buy a newspaper because you need to stay in touch. How much is a newspaper in the city of Chicago? You have no idea, right? Oh, thanks. Uh, a typical newspaper in Chicago, I'm going to say two bucks. You buy one every single day of the week. So that's six days of the week because the one on Sunday is more. So it's two dollars times six days of the week. That's twelve dollars a week. We're just going to do the weekly one first, and then you can add, we'll just multiply that times fifty-two. So you not only buy that one, but you also buy a USA Today because you want to be informed not just locally, but you want to be informed globally, right? That's another three bucks a day, whatever. So instead of twelve, that's now um, uh, actually that's twelve times six. Uh, three times six is uh, eighteen. Uh, that's what we're going to do for that on Sunday. You buy the Chicago Tribune, which is three dollars and fifty cents, but you also buy New York Times, which is four dollars. So that's seven dollars and fifty cents for that. I'm just going to round it up to eight, just to make it simple, right? Oh, you also get yeah. We'll just take it at that. We're not going to be too greedy. That's thirty-eight dollars, right? What's thirty-eight times fifty-two? <laughs> the thing about keeping receipts is that most people will tell you, you don't need a receipt for anything under $25. How many people in this room take taxis everywhere they go? Work-wise, yeah. Sure, taxis everywhere you go. And every time you take a taxi, you ask them for a receipt. I know you do. And they also, they don't hand you just one of those little pieces of paper. They hand you multiple copies of blank receipts, right? What is your taxi expenses a week? It could easily be 50 bucks a week, but let's not be greedy. Let's just say 25. What's 25 times 50? Uh, 1,250. 1,000 what? 250. Parking. Do you use the parking app or do you actually feed the meter now, all the quarters? Parking app. There you go. <laughs> you do some parking app, but about half of what you do is quarters. Because your phone, you're always on it and it dies all the time, whatever. So your parking is probably at least three bucks a day, right? That you can't really count for. It's three dollars and quarters that you jam in the meter every single day, five days a week, right? That's fifteen bucks a week times fifty weeks. How much? Seventy-five. 
I actually used to do this with the bus now. The problem with the uh, venture card though is that you can't do this anymore because it all goes through that account, so you really can't do that part anymore. But let's just look at this really quick. So can you add that number set of numbers up for me really quick? Wait, so you can't like Uber, you can't call that to a receipt for it? Of course you can. Okay. Right? Four thousand four hundred and seventy six. Could you multiply that times thirty three percent? So this is what I've just saved you right off the top of my head. Uh, one thousand four hundred and seventy seven dollars. One thousand four hundred and seventy seven dollars. That's what I would save in taxes in my tax bracket. And I just started. I didn't work at this that hard. I did that in uh, seven months. But when we're, you know, making like six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a year, we have to be careful how much money we're writing off because over time, because that's when you can like upcharge it one year and then do a little Flipping it year to year is a little bit more difficult. The thing, the truth of the matter is, this is a tax savings. If you're not making any money, you're not taxed on, you're not paying any taxes, so there's no incentive to save any of it. There's no reason to do any of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're making ten thousand dollars a year. Yeah. You come up with three thousand dollars expenses. You pay fifteen percent of the seven thousand dollars that remains, and so yeah, it's a grand. I mean, that's what you're out. I mean, this isn't going to play that big of a game. But once things start getting ratcheted up, then this stuff starts to make a difference. And I will say that Jenny's mantra, and it's the last thing I'll leave you with, is absolutely true. I to this day. If I'm going through a toll in Indiana and it's the little exit guy at the very end and it's 15 cents, I get a receipt for 15 cents. And I know that sounds incredibly petty, but my lawyer said this to me once. I'm going to leave this last thing I'm going to leave with you guys right now. If you pay attention to the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. Nothing is too small. A receipt for everything, every single thing that you do. I don't care what it is. I'll see you guys next week. And also, um, I told him that's how I do. Hey Morgan. So to get to the video, go to YouTube, do a search for my name, look on online to make sure you know how to spell it. So it'll be under cursor, yeah. not under John. Okay. Uh, and my channel will be there and you'll be able to find it. And so it's this is what you'll be looking for. This thing where it says freelance business FA sixteen. Okay. That's what you're looking for. Cool. And you'll be good. As a matter of fact, that's the one that you missed. Awesome. So you'll be good. Awesome. Right. Thank you. See you next week. Will you show us like your fresh books or whatever? Yes, I will. I will. This is an example. Yes, I will. Right. Do me a favor. Shoot me an email and remind me because I can actually set it up and show you. I, it'll just be faster. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you have it all ready and say, here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I have a question. Ask me anything. So last year I did a sole proprietor for my business uh -huh. so I could write stuff off uh -huh. and I didn't make a ton of money. All right. And then this year I just didn't do one at all. Uh -huh. well, so I didn't want to pay an account. Right. And didn't, didn't have. It'll good just go in your finances. regular income tax return then. So it's fine. Oh, yeah. like, I mean, like last year I just did normal taxes. I didn't. I didn't That's all you'll do this year. Are you sure? I made a lot of money through 1099s. Yeah, but it'll still. Yeah, no, but that's still something you're going to have to show okay. on your tax return. Just not my personal business stuff. No, but again, every 1099 that you get becomes an item that is actually going to be entered. It's just entered on your tax return on a different line. So that's that's fine. That's just the money I'm making on my own for weddings. Right. Which like isn't that much. It's, it's more over here, but it's still not like. Right. But are you declaring? It? Are you? I didn't. Want to. All right. All I can say to you is that. 
not declaring it would be illegal. Um, I thought it was Again, one of my accountants used to say to me is that I can teach you to be.